All right, uh, next up we've got Graham Dumpleton. He's the author of Mod Whiskey, a module for hosting Python web applications using Apache, as well as the Wrapped module. Um, give it up for Graham. Okay, hi, I'm Graham, as she's mentioned. For those who, who don't know me, my original interest in hosting Python web applications started when I began working on the Mod Python module for Apache. Uh, when I recovered from that, I went on to write the Mod Whiskey module, uh, which implements the Whiskey specifica specification for Apache. In this talk, I'm going to discuss some of the latest research I have been doing on visualizing what happens inside of a Whiskey server when it's handling web requests. At the end of this talk, I hope you'll be able to walk away with a better understanding of some of the performance issues that occur with Python Whiskey servers. Um, and also, uh, although I may not be able to give you any concrete solutions for that, at least to give you an idea of, of the, what those issues are so you can keep them in mind when you go back and set up your own Python web hosting. Now, the original title of this talk indicated my intention to use benchmarks to understand how Whiskey servers worked. Various benchmarks do already exist comparing Python and Whiskey servers. But they tend to be of questionable value, given that they're going to have little or no relevance to your own specific Python web application. A further problem with benchmarks is that they treat Whiskey servers as black boxes. They do not really help you to understand what is going on inside of the actual Whiskey server. This makes it impossible to evaluate whether the configuration used for a test was the best that could be achieved and so whether any comparison that was being done between different whiskey servers was even fair. But what is the real goal that we're trying to solve here anyway? If you think it is to find the fastest whiskey server around, you'd be wrong. Going down that path can be a monumental waste of time, as the whiskey server is not magically going to solve all your problems. You still need to make decisions about how to configure your whiskey server, and such benchmarks are not going to help you. Your own Python web application is unique. How it behaves will be different to everyone else's application. It is not going to consist of just a hello world as most benchmarks usually use. To better illustrate what is going on inside of a Whiskey server, I've been researching alternate ways of presenting the information one can extract from the actual Whiskey server itself. To introduce you to that, I want to start out with show by showing a video clip visualizing the data captured when Whiskey requests are being handled by Mod Whiskey. As you watch this scroll by, each vertical dashed line represents one request, a uh, one second. The bars then depict the actual web requests as they arrive over time. The length of each bar is depicting how long the web request took. As you can see, although the response time for most is short, these are interspersed with web requests which take longer to handle. For this test, the Whiskey server was only handling about 20 requests per second, but the variable length of the response times for requests meant that the Whiskey server still needed to be able to handle multiple requests at the same time to ensure that no requests were being held up. The configuration used here had three processes, where each process was running with three threads. As the web requests arrived, they were distributed across each of the three processes <coughs> being handled by whichever thread in the process was available to accept the request. As you can see, there are lots of gaps between requests. This means that the Whiskey server was running at a low level of capacity utilization and still potentially had capacity for handling a greater number of requests. The big question is how much more traffic could the Whiskey server actually handle with this configuration? You might think this would be a simple thing to determine, but it isn't. This is because the time taken to handle a request can be affected by an increase in the number of requests, as well as how much work is performed by any concurrent requests. This means that things don't necessarily scale up in a predictable way. What the impacts are of an increased workload, we can start to assess by factoring into our visualization the CPU burn for each request. This is the amount of CPU usage that each request uses up. A request which is CPU intensive is displayed here as being darker, with it potentially showing as black if it achieved 100% CPU utilization for the period of the request. At the other end of the scale, 
a request which was entirely I.O. bound would show as being white. With our updated visualisation, now they've started evaluating the effects of different types of workloads and the impacts of certain server configurations. For our first workload, let's run a test where the WSGI application was I.O. bound. That is for, is for the majority of the time the request handler was waiting on some activity to complete. We will simulate the I.O. bound activity by having the WSGI application make a call out to a service which reliably responds in about a second. Initially, we will only use a single client. Because it is an I.O. bound activity, there is no significant CPU usage, and thus the bars depicting each request are white. Now let's try this with multiple clients, all sending requests at the same time. In this case, with each of the four clients issuing a total of five requests, the overall test still completed in about the same time. So for a situation where all the requests are I.O. bound, everything looks fine. The next question is whether this will hold if we change now to a CPU bound activity instead of an I.O. bound one. To replicate a CPU bound task, what we can do is to have the WSGI application execute a tight loop calling a Python function a few million times. One can immediately see how the bars representing the requests are now black, indicating this was a highly CPU intensive task. Let's now step, up, to step this up to two clients, with the WSGI application still performing the same amount of work for each request. Have a good think first, though, about what you think should happen. You ready to see if you're right? When we add a second client, the time taken to handle each request is a bit more than twice what it was for a single request. This is even though we're doing the same amount of work for each request. So was your assumption right? So let's try four clients now to see if we can make some sense of this. Once again, things get worse. When we increase it to four clients, how can this be though? The WSGI server configuration in this case had multiple threads available to handle requests. In fact, more than four threads were allocated for handling requests, so capacity was not an issue. One clue as to what is going on is how the shading of the bars depicting the requests get lighter as the number of clients making concurrent requests is increased. Let's review how the measure for CPU burn is calculated and what is meant by it. CPU burn is calculated as the amount of CPU time consumed to, to handle a request, divided by the wall clock time taken to handle that request. How much CPU time is consumed will depend on how much of a request time is spent on CPU bound tasks, such as data processing, or template rendering versus being blocked waiting on an external event such as a database query. <coughs> Ultimately, the way in which it is calculated means that the amount of CPU usage consumed stays the same, but the request takes longer to be handled for some, for some requests than the CPU burn, which is a percentage, would decrease. In our test here, although the same amount of work was being done, something was causing everything to take longer. And as a result, the shade of the bars depicting our request was lighter. Before we get to the cause of the issue, let's explore further how significant the effects are. Rather than a timeline visualization, let's actually use a chart this time, showing request time, CPU time, CPU burn as percentage, and as, as the number of concurrent requests has increased. From the chart, although we have a multi-threaded configuration, we appear to get absolutely no benefit from that. Instead, as the number of concurrent requests has increased, the length of time taken to handle the request actually just keeps increasing. This increase in request time is despite the CPU time consumed per request always staying at about the same level. A problem in understanding what is going on is that the measure of CPU burn shows so far is that for each specific request. What we are missing is what is happening with CPU usage across the whole process. That is, the summation of CPU time consumed in any specific period for overlapping requests. We can add this to our visualization though, overlaying the request on a background which shows overall CPU usage between specific events such as the start and end of requests. In this case, a greater amount of CPU usage in any specific period 
will show as a darker shade of red. We are showing the visualization with our multi-process configuration of free processes and free threads again, so let's go back to our single process case again. So same request as before, with the CPU burn decreasing as the number of concurrent requests has increased, but overlaid on top of the CPU usage for the whole process. Possibly a little hard to see, yep. <laughs> um, but the whole of, CPU, whole of process CPU usage is somewhat less for the single client case compared to the two or more clients, as we would expect. But where in the case of two or more clients, the CPU usage appears to be, at, be about the same, based on the colours. Let's see how this looks in our, our when we include this in our process C, which looks, Let's look, see how this looks though when we include the process CPU usage on our chart instead of might make it a bit clearer. So what we can see here is that for a request which was completely CPU bound, that the total amount of CPU usage that was able to be harnessed very quickly plateaued with the addition of a second client. The maximum process-wide CPU usage able to be consumed was 180%, or the equivalent of one and a half CPU cores. This was despite the system the test was running on having eight CPU cores. How about if we now change the test being performed by the request so that it's still performing some CPU bound work, but for a large part of the time is IO bound instead, blocking waiting for some external event to occur. So winding back the, C the amount of CPU bound work, <laughs> sorry, excuse me, winding back the amount of CPU bound work being performed such that the per request CPU burn was equivalent to about 25%, we see that initially the request time stays relatively stable as the number of concurrent requests has increased, only increasing a slight bit. <sighs> Might have to get some water in a sec. Can someone open this for me? Thanks. Sure. Now I lost where I'm up to. <laughs> when we hit five concurrent requests, however, we again see an increase in request time, with overall process CPU usage eventually reaching that plateau at 150%. Regardless, therefore, of how many... Re <laughs> I got the wrong bottle? No, I'm the glass. <laughs> it looks better with the bottle, doesn't it? So regardless, therefore, of how many, requests, how many threads we have available to handle requests, we eventually reach a limit of how many requests, concurrent requests we can actually handle before request time starts to increase. The number of concurrent requests we ha can handle seems to be directly related to the re per request CPU burn, but also with that unexpected ceiling of about 150%, even though we had eight CPU cores. And the bane of all our problems? That would, as many may have already guessed, is the Python, interpreter global, glo Python global interpreter lock, or as is more commonly called the GIL. The GIL means that if, although we have threading in CPython, and they even make use of system threads, they don't really behave entirely like threading would if you were using a language such as C or C++. One of the main reasons for the existence of the GIL in Python is the reference counting used for memory management. Without the GIL, different threads would interfere with each other when accessing shared data, such as an object's reference count, causing memory corruption and potentially process crashes. The GIL prevents such problems, but it does come at a cost, though. The big restriction imposed by the global interpreter lock is that only one thread can actually be running Python code at any one point in time. Concurrency is achieved by switching which thread is allowed to run Python code every 100 Python virtual instructions. While a thread doesn't have the GIL, it will be paused. This switching between threads when a, when a CPU bound activity is being performed means that any CPU bound activity will take longer than if there was only a single thread active. Even if the task is not heavily CPU bound, as in our 25% CPU burn case, more concurrent requests will still cause some measure of slowdown, ballooning out when we hit the effective upper bound on the total CPU usage that the Python interpreter can utilize as a whole from that one process. The solution? The only thing that can be done is not run multiple CPU bound tasks within the same process at the same time. One could farm out tasks to a background task execution system, or if this cannot be done, 
then one can switch from using a multi-threaded server configuration to one which uses multiple processes instead. Having done this, we can now see how time spent handling a request is now relatively consistent even as the number of concurrent requests increases. This is, there is a hidden danger here though. If we use more processes, then we need more memory for all those processes. But memory is also going to be bounded for the system. We're also still bounded by the CPU power available on the host. We cannot therefore arbitrarily increase the number of processes and are going to have to stop somewhere eventually. So with a memory constrained host, the number of processes we can realistically create might be quite small in number. The use of a small number of single threaded processes introduces a greater risk though of what's called backlogging. That is, the number of concurrent requests, if the number of concurrent requests is greater than the number of processes, and we have a sequence of long running requests, new requests may have to wait. So if we start off a number of concurrent requests at the same time, we can see how once we exceed four, which was the number of processes we had, the maximum time that the extra requests had to wait, which is the queue time here, the red line, Big red line. Um, at the wait, it jumped out to almost a second. This jumped out again when we exceeded eight clients, all sending a request at the same time. This is a time delay which will be seen by your users. The problem with backlogging isn't restricted to just CPU down, bound tasks and applies to any long running request. So let's return to our timeline visualization and run a test with four clients and four server processes with one thread per process. This time though, we will use concurrent IO bound requests. When we do this, all appears quite orderly with everything being handled in a timely manner. For reference, the number on each request denotes the batch of requests the specific request was a part of. Thus, I had four batches of four requests one at a time from each of the four clients. If we run the test with five clients though, and we start to see problems. With each batch of requests now having five requests in it, four processes isn't going to be enough to handle them all at the same time. As a result, one of the requests from the first batch will get delayed, only being handled once one of the other requests in that first batch has completed. Basically, at this point in time, the Whiskey server had reached capacity. The flow and effect of such backlogging will only get worse as long as too many requests arrive over and above what the Whiskey server is capable of handling at that time. So up until now, we've been testing using a single type of request each time. We've seen how if we, you have an IO bound task, that one can safely use multiple threads within a process with no undue effects. Using multi-threading when you have CPU bound tasks though can lead to increased response times for requests. This problem can only be solved by using multiple processes instead of threads. Now reality is though that your web application will not exclusively have one type of request or another. You are more likely to have a mix of CPU bound and IO bound tasks as well as requests that fall in the middle. What your Python web application is definitely not going to be like is those Hello World programs that people like to use for benchmarks. If you want to know what those benchmarks look like with my visualization, then here it is. This equates to over 100 million web requests per day on a single host. Now, if your site is going to be handling that amount of traffic a day, then I don't really think you're going to be trusting it to run on a single host. You also are not going to be pushing it to the maximum capacity as is shown here and as what people do when they run benchmarks. So benchmarks are not going to be a realistic, not going to give you a realistic view of how that server really performs for your case. So because you will have a range of requests types, in the end there isn't unfortunately a simple recipe I can give you to follow to tune your whiskey server. And this is because your specific web application is going to be unique, as I said before. The intent of this talk was therefore mainly aimed at illustrating better the underlying issues. The first actual step to you being able to find an answer for yourself 
is going to be to add monitoring specifically targeted towards working out what is happening inside of the WSGI server you're using. Performance monitoring software does exist for Python web applications, and I wrote one once before, but they don't dig into the WSGI server enough, and so although they may help with identifying bottlenecks in your <coughs> web application or database, do not really help you to tune the WSGI server itself. The problem with the monitoring of the WSGI server is to do it without causing undue overheads. It really needs to be in the WSGI server itself. This means that WSGI server authors like myself need to add it to make your job easier. So my intention, therefore, is to release an updated version of ModWSGI, which incorporates the monitoring used to obtain the data seen in the visualizations that I've shown you today. I'll also follow up the talk with a more detailed series of blog posts about the issue explaining how to interpret the data you get for your own web application and use it to then tune ModWSGI and Apache for yourself. And if you've seen where I've done this before with my, my wrapped talk I did a couple of years ago at PyCon New Zealand, hopefully you'll appreciate. I, I do like doing those posts and I will cover it in a lot of detail. So to finish up, a bit of an announcement in case you haven't already seen me mention on Twitter. Uh, and this is that I am happy to say that I've recently switched jobs and I'm now working for Red Hat, and I will be working there as a developer evangelist for OpenShift, which is Red Hat's platform as a service. Now, why this might be interested to you, not because you'll see me pushing that service a bit, but it will give me more time to work, <coughs> be more proactive in actually doing these things I've been doing, looking at the analysis of WSGI performance, and generally improving the Python web hosting experience for everyone. Um, so before I was quite limited in my, I like doing that, but I, I never got the time for my, with my work. But this time I should now. Especially with OpenShift moving to using Docker and Kubernetes, I think the possibilities for improved Python web hosting have never been better. And so that's why I'm particularly excited with, with joining Red Hat. So do keep an eye on my personal blog, as well as that for the OpenShift blog, because I will start be talking about a lot of these performance issues that's there, as well as on my own site. Um, and I keep an eye out for possible releases of ModWisk in the future. But for now, if you've got any questions, I'm glad to take them. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I uh, work on a fairly standard content management system, um, hosts a whole bunch of websites and pulls use content from different places and all that. We've got a bunch of different services running inside uh, uh, G Unicorn. Um, and I've just recently been, had the time to start looking at uh, some of these performance issues and I've had reason to kind of dig right down into how WSGI is doing certain things. Um, and so I noticed that in G Unicorn there's now, uh, you can now use StatsD and things like that. Um, uh, or, I don't know, what are, what are some out-of-the-box kind of tools that you could recommend that might help with setting up some of this monitoring? Um, That's a very open question, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of the things I've been looking at for this talk, some of the things I've been looking at with CPU burn, there are existing performance monitoring tools that exist but um, that try and package that sort of monitoring up. And my previous job was New Relic, um, but also have changed jobs now and where I did that. Now, some of the things I've been looking at with CPU, but they don't capture them. And some of the other things I've been using here, which is queuing time within the WSGI server and other things about CPU processes as a whole, and things, they, they don't capture in a way which you can tie it to specific requests. It's all aggregated data. Um, so as far as using the tune the WSGI server, I don't think there's actually a good solution out there now which comes with something you can just drop in and it'll work. And that's where I'm working towards. Um, and I have done some blogs in the past about how you can use WSGI middleware wrappers around your app to try and capture request times. And you could bolt things in like that, but then you start to get a performance issue. Um, and, but if you are prepared to do that, then other, another tool is Datadog, which is nothing you can put in, or you've got StatsD and things like this. Um, the only problem I have with StatsD, I have various issues with StatsD. Um, 
in, in the New Relic, um, in the pro plan, which obviously you don't have, we, one, one, of the, no, okay. <laughs> one, one of the reports that goes partly towards being able to use that data for tuning the WSCU server is capacity, capacity utilization report, capacity analysis or something. Yeah, right. um, and one of those slides I had there where I talked about how you can see the gaps between the requests. Yeah. And when you take the total time, total number of request time, and divide that in, that's potentially how much of your capacity you're using, and that's what that chart shows. Uh, but the unfortunate thing about that is that it is an aggregated value, and if you've got model processes, it's, it's looking at the whole box. If you've got model systems across the whole system. Um, so yeah, it's not, not a good, that's why I think it's just not a good solution right now. Any other questions? No, okay, someone's got yeah. Uh, um, am I correct in understanding then that the problem that you were sort of describing through most of your presentation is really an issue if your most of your requests are CPU bound, and 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 that's probably a fairly unusual case. Is that right? Or? Template rendering is it takes up CPU um, usage. Like, um, a lot of things are going to use a fair bit of CPU pressing time. They're not all going to be in the database all the time. Um, and that's where you, you're going to end up in the middle somewhere most of the time. Like my example is an extreme case because I had essentially just hammering it. Uh, and I did that just to show what the extreme is. Um, but I have seen situations where it has been significant enough that uh, once you sort of, if you have a multi-threaded multi configuration, that it was actually affecting performance of the website. Because I got to see a lot of different customers' data from, from the New Relic stuff at times. Um, and yeah, so, so it, can, it can be still quite significant. And what's sort of a bit uh, annoying, not annoying, but um, frustrating because you couldn't do anything about it. You, you know, I see this a lot with helping out people with ModWizKey and they say, oh, I'm using this configuration and they thought that I need a high number of, I need to handle a really high number of requests and they'll go and create 50 threads. And all I've done is exasperate the problem. Um, so even for a situation where you don't have really high level CPU burn, uh, I find that running uh, each process with a maximum of three to five threads is still good and try and go for more processes. But then that's where you have to balance it with the number, amount of memory you got. And if you're deploying to a platform as a service, often you only get uh, 512 meg, 512 meg and it's one CPU, and it's actually quite limiting. You, you sort of, and especially with Goonicorn, Goonicorn only can do processes and it can't do multi-threading, and that's where it's a bit strange that people keep promoting Goonicorn on something, a platform like Heroku, because to do concurrency, you have to use more processes, which immediately you start hitting the 512 megabyte limit, and oh, maybe good for Heroku, because then you have to buy more dinos. Um, and you can't properly balance finding that good middle ground of a certain number of processes with some level of threads as well. Um, yes, yeah, so it really depends on the individual apps. But you need to start being able to get that data out about, about CPU burn. And one of the things I hope to do is take what I've done already and start tying that to, um, if you're using Django, for example, that this particular view handler, this is your CPU burn for that view handler. Uh, and then, um, if you get a list of all your view handlers, you know which one is the most traffic, um, uh, or, and you can look at that CPU burn and in total and work out that one. What can I do to decrease that? Or you might decide that you can vertically partition your app, which is basically meaning that uh, you can set up ModWizKey such that you actually have two copies of your application running. Uh, one is set up with five processes, single thread, and this one might be one process with 20 threads. And all your I.O. bound tasks go here, and all your CPU bound one goes over here. And that way you can balance things a lot better. Um, you could do it with other, other things if you use WSGI as well, because Nginx could be set up to um, uh, spread it out to multiple WSGI ones in a different configuration. So there's all sorts of magic you can do there, but you need the monitoring, monitoring to, do it, to work it out. Uh, sorry, I had one. Um, I really like those. Uh, uh, visuals that you got there. I was just wondering, when you were shown the visuals for the actual benchmarks, did you have a 
tool that you used to collect that from the benchmarks, or did you modify the benchmark code to add monitoring? Okay, what I've done for all these benchmarks is I've got inside of ModWizGi an eventing mechanism so that I can sub register a handler which is told when a request starts and when a request properly finishes. And it gives me CPU burn and all sorts of things which has been calculated by ModWizGi. And in this particular case, for these visualizations, I was essentially, when the request finishes, was just dumping out a dict record in a file. So I'd end up with one big file. I was then going and processing that file and using Report Lab, of all things, to draw up some pretty pictures. And the video was funny. That was one huge PDF, which I turned into an image and then shoved it into um, ScreenFlow on a Mac and scrolled it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's certainly some work I can do there with um, better ways of bringing that data out into a process and put a nice website on it so you can, you can get access. That's things I want to do and I want to play around with things like a, a real-time uh, time series database thing called InfluxDB, which has um, been coming along very nicely for collecting all that sort of data and that can be hooked up to Grafana and you can get some really nice graphs out of this. That's what I want to play with down the track. Uh, in the context of web sockets and any work that might be done in the future on that, I would assume that you would then go and add some events for um, starting work in a particular socket and finishing work in that socket as well? Monitoring of web sockets and async is horrible. Um, <laughs> but if, and I, I, have a, I have a plan of how I can put web socket support in, um, in Apache as part of ModWizGi. Uh, and see if it would coexist with, with the you know, Whiskey app as well. Uh, if I can do that, um, because I, in, in the mod Whiskey level, control when things are going back and forward in the request, and I can possibly start monitoring that as well. But if you want to try and start adding monitoring into a uh, web socket with G event and the thing that already exists and you can't modify the code and you're dependent on monkey patching, it gets really horrible. So hopefully if I can work out my web socket solution for Apache and mod Whiskey, then yeah, 